I got stumped on a problem in physics today, and so I'm still recovering from that at the moment, Audric. <laughs> Every so often, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this day. I just pray you'd uh, guide our steps and just help us to understand a little bit about this, this the Bay Integral, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. So, um, section, the first couple sections, all right, in... Um, uh, chapter 2, which is on the LeBay Integral, right? And um, so let me just read a little bit of the introduction. This is section 2.1. Um, it says, the main one of the, the main purpose of this book is to present the basic methods and applications of Hilbert spaces. One of the most important examples of Hilbert spaces from the point of uh, view of both theory and applications is the space of LeBay integrable, LeBay square integrable functions on RN. Thus, the LeBay Integral is, an essential, is essential for understanding some of the most important aspects of Hilbert space theory. Um, he gives a little bit of the history here. So he says, uh, Henry LeBay, uh, who lived 1875 to 1941, in a series of five short notes published between 1899 and 1901, he introduced a new integral, all right? And um, now that's universally called the LeBay integral. And um, anyway, so basically there's a lot of different approaches to discussing this LeBay integral. A lot of the approaches spend um, a good amount of time first building something called measure theory. And like you study Borel sets, you do a bunch of really theoretical um, background work in order to just set up the integral. So if we were to take that approach, we'd be in that digression for a while. So the way this book does um, is a different way. He says introduced by um, McNeil um, and uh, Makunsky. I can't say that. Makuzinski. Makuzinski. This is the same, I think the same author that he used the... Uh, different proof for the, um, what was it, totally, what's that thing called, the, uh, it's the theorem at the end of chapter one. The Banach explained. The what? The Banach explained. The what? The Banach fixed point theorem. No, not the Banach fixed point theorem, the, uh, the one at the very end of, uh, the before that. It's the totally bounded or, yeah, before that. No, no, before that. Uh, oh, Banach. Oh. Yeah, the, it's, yeah, the proof of the banach steinhaus theorem, which is the, uh, it's sometimes called the, um, oh, oh, uniform boundedness. yeah, the uniform boundedness principle. So the usual proof of that is by the Baer category theorem. It's a homework problem in Munkery's, but in this book he gives this rather technical diagonalization um, technique, which is, involves an infinite matrix and some really kind of, kind of sneaky stuff. But it's concrete. It doesn't involve further abstraction, right? Like their category theorem is kind of abstract. And so the, in some sense, to the taste of the, ana the an analyst, the proof that's given in this book is perhaps more um, natural. But anyway, um, that same Makuzinski, <laughs> that name come up again, which makes me wonder if the, uh, the author of this book was a student of his or something because Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's one of the authors of the book. Well, there you go. Actually, is that the... Oh, it's J. Wait a minute. P. P. Ah, maybe we, we might be dealing with a... Son or something. A son, perhaps, or cousin, or... You never know. Hmm. I'll have to figure this out. But, um... <laughs> like, the, like the Bernoullis? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have enough time to figure out the Bernoullis, but, uh... There's something like eight of them that are active in publication or something, the three main ones, but there's, you know, tertiary Bernoullis that are <laughs> it's a lot to keep track of. Anyway, so the long story short of this is that um, Mikuzinski, one of the authors of this book, not, the, not that, perhaps the father, who knows, um, you know, has a, has a more direct approach to the LeBay um, theory, which, LeBay integral, and that's what we're going to look at in this book. And um, so, Essentially, it starts with this technical preliminary on, on what are called step functions, right? So, um, I guess I probably I was I was just going to be really bold and jump straight to the definition of the LeBay integral, but I, I I guess I'll I'll be a good citizen and spend at least a few minutes on the step function section. So, what's a step function? So, um, 
He says, a step function on the real line is a finite linear combination of characteristic functions on semi-open intervals. That begs the question, what's the characteristic function on a semi-open interval? So um, I might use this notation, chi um, a comma b. All right, so this of um, t is equal to what? So the, the answer here is this, this function is, it's a character, what's a characteristic function, do you know? So there, there you can characterize a set with the characteristic function. The way it works is kind of boring. It's one if t is an element of the interval, all right? And um, it's zero if t is not an element. All right. So, for example, you can talk about the characteristic function of the uh, of the rationals. This is a kind of funny function. It's it's one if t is rational, and it's zero if t is irrational. Right. And so the backdrop here is we're gonna we're gonna talk about step functions on the reals. All right. As he mentions, the, pr the approach of this book is to first develop the Bay integration over the real numbers, then bump it up to the complex numbers, then bump it up to the to functions of Rn. Okay, that's the, the progression of ideas. But these are these are these are characteristic functions. Now, um, this characteristic function is actually one of the main reasons that you find yourself wanting to talk about like the LeBay integrals. Things like this are kind of a little bit out of the scope of the Riemann integral. This is a function which is everywhere discontinuous. You know? Think about it. Try to graph this. What does it look like? <laughs> it's like, it looks like two, two horizontal lines, right? I mean, it's, it's always either one or zero. Anyway, so he introduces a little bit more notation, something like this, the characteristic function on, say, a, a n to b n he denotes by fn, right? And he says a step function is something that looks like this. f is equal to like lambda 1 f1, lambda 2 f2, plus da da da, plus you know, lambda n fn. So a step function is a linear combination of characteristic functions um, on half open intervals like this for him. That's his definition of step function, all right? And um, the reason it's called a step function is if you were to graph one of these things, like here, let me be, let me be nause nauseatingly specific here for a minute. Um, so example one, let's let f be equal to like the characteristic function on zero to one, um, you know, plus the character, plus, plus two times the characteristic function on, um, I don't know, one to one to, 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 to five, right? And then um, plus three times the characteristic function on, oh, I don't know, three to, three to seven, all right? So that would be an example of a step function. What's its graph look like? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So zero to one, maybe you got this step, right? And then at two, um, at, at one, this one kicks in, and then you add two, so one plus two, that gets you up to three, right? And um, let's see, that goes until you get one, two, three, four, five, over here to five. So when I get to, well, that, that continues until I get to three, right? Then at three, what happens? At three, I've got this and this are both non-zero. So I get two plus three and it, it, it kicks it up to five here. Yeah. Now, now when I get to five, this one drops out and just back to three again. What's that? 
And so, and if you want, sometimes it's, sometimes we like to draw vertical connecting lines just so it's easier on the eyes. But of course, you know that that graphically speaking is not part of the math, it's just part of the visualization, yeah? And I mean, the question is, okay, so w w where's this point? Just to be fussy for a second. Is this point here or is it here? The, yeah, the ladder up here, right? So this is technically open. And I think it's up here again. This one's open to be fussy. And I think it's down here now. And this one's open, right? And then this is open, technically. All right. Is that... Sorry, Audric. <laughs> Are you okay? Okay, good. Yeah, we're, we're in the luxurious two-board room today, so. <laughs> All right, so anyway, there you go. Step, you, see, you can see why it's called a step function, obviously, right? Okay, so, great. Now, um, <clears throat> he calls this the basic representation, and then what do we do with that? Well, um, he points out that the collection of all the step functions on R is a vector space. If you add step functions together, you get another step function. Scalar multiply a step function, get a step function, right? So, um, and, um, and then he defines the integral of a step function, right? So that's probably worth writing down. Definition. What's the integral of a step function? Um, so let's let f equal to you know, lambda 1 f1, lambda 2 f2, lambda n fn, where f1 through fn again are characteristic functions on, sem you know, half open intervals, right? Klopen intervals. <laughs> Sorry, it's horrible. Um, anyway, then um, the integral of f is equal to what? So here, fk is equal to the characteristic function on a sub k comma b sub k, to be explicit. By the way, the characteristic function notation is not in the book. I'm adding that. All right, just, so that's just me. I think it's nice to have a notation since it's kind of the basic building block here. How would you define that integral? Let's see here. Hmm. So, what is it then? So, yeah, lambda one times b one minus a one, right? plus lambda 2 times b2 minus a2 plus da, 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 plus lambda k times bk minus ak. Okay. Oh, n, 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 my bad, n. N, all right. So that would be the, uh, now the, the thing that's bugging me a little bit is like, what about the overlap, right? Because so like, and if you go back to my picture over here, fine, there's like different things to think about. So like the first piece, you've got this, this piece right there, right? And then one to five, what's that look like? So two times, um, you know, characteristic function, two, two from, from one to five, that's, I guess that's like this, right? That's this, and then, then you've got three, from three to seven, which would be, I mean, directly visualizing it, that's this, right? And the thing is, when you add these, 
you know, as you, well, wait a minute, what was that? Oh man, I sold you guys a bill of goods, right? This isn't right. That was supposed to be what? That's supposed to be two, my bad. I know you might not have understood that I was wrong because I was vague, but that, that was supposed to be two. Whereas this up over here is at three. Sorry about that. So I, I think you can, it makes sense that the area under the step function, right? It's the sum of the blue, the green, and the black, even, even though the, like the overlap doesn't matter, right? It makes sense still it gives you, because, you know, essentially what you're missing is just the translation, shift this green box up here, then you've got the total area, right? So like, anyway, that, that is totally reasonable that that's the area from an intuitive perspective, right? So that, that, there you go, that's the definition of the integral of a step function. We can just basically use the weights and the lengths um, of the, uh, the intervals, of course, you know, underlying the characteristic functions. Right. Well, what I'm saying is, like, if we look at the place where there's the overlap here, yeah. um, you know, that I should have basically going from three to five, its height is um, five, right? So there, there should be like 10 units, 10 units of area from that part of it. And I get that because if, I, if I'm adding together the green area and the bl black area, they, they double up in exactly the way you need them to to make it work out, you know. There's six of the black in there and there's four of the green, so six plus four is 10. I mean, and I'm sure there's a way to prove this more like rigorously, right? Um, but um, so since we're dealing with finitely many things, you know, you, you, could, you could take the basic representation, right? And you could take these things and you could rewrite it as a sum of non-overlapping steps, right? If you wanted to. It's finitely many things, you can sort it out. So I could take this was, was a sum of three characteristic functions and that they overlapped, right? And I could write it as a sum of one, two, three, four characteristic non-overlapping functions, right? I could say, I can see from this that in fact this is equal to, you know, characteristic function from 0 to 1 plus, uh, um, well, 2 times the characteristic function from, well, 1 to 2, uh, 1 to 3 rather, right? And then plus 5 times the characteristic function from 3 to 5, and then plus 3 times the characteristic function from 5 to 7, if I was so inclined, you know? And once you do that, and you sort through the details of that, I suppose, <laughs> you can easily argue that the uh, area of non-overlapping step functions is certainly just the direct sum of the areas of the steps, right? And so, I don't know, you could, I, I could foresee doing proofs where you, you know, reduce any, um, the basic representation to an, uh, uh, distinct steps, you know? But I also see that we don't want to do that, right? Apparently we can prove, I mean, he calls this the basic representation. So I'm assuming that you can make proofs go through even though they're overlapping. And I'm content with that, you know? Uh, it's reminiscent of the stuff we do in differential equations where we build the uh, heavy side functions to turn functions on and off. You, end up with like differences of characteristic functions that go to infinity, but I'm getting off track now. Let me stop talking about courses you guys are not like just fresh from. So theorem is, you know, um, so we have like integral of a sum, sum of the integrals, you have, um, pull the constant out. You have 
pre preservation of inequality. You have the absolute value of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. And you, and you also have this last one, which I'll talk a little bit more about, tau z f equals the integral over f for. So this is um, theorem 2.2.2, if you're keeping track. And so here, it's assumed that f and g are step functions, OK? Does this make sense? It's nice that we have an integration where we don't have to write the dx. <laughs> How much writing do you save? Don't tell the freshman, you know? All right. So. No, no, this would be, that would have to be understood for all points in the domain. Okay. Which is why that statement he has about min and max on uh, like page 40, 40, I think, kind of weirded me out, you know? Like, what does he mean by that? He's like, minimum of the function is one half the sum of the functions minus the absolute value of their difference and the max of two functions is sum of the functions plus the absolute value of their difference. I mean, I think that has to be understood point wise. The equation at the bottom of page 40. Because I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I'm just. I'm not sure what I think about that equation is all I'm saying. Okay, guys. All right, so what's the, what is the support? That's important. That's an important idea. What's the support of f? What's that equal to? Oh, thanks. <laughs> So he defines this on page 41. He says the support of f, which is oftentimes denoted just sup f, is what? It's the set of, so at the moment, this is going to be x and r such that what? f of x is not equal to 0. So for example, if you're talking about the zero function, then what's the support? The empty set, right? So, or if you had the constant function, right? So like f of x equals to a constant for all x, right? Then support of f would be what? Yeah, it is just the whole real, yeah. But of course, the support for a step function is what? So like the support for the step function in my definition would be what? Right, so we could say union k equals 1 to n, right? Union k equals 1 to n of the half open the Klopin intervals a sub k comma b sub k that would be that would be the support that's the places where it's non-zero assuming of course that the uh, the weights the lambda ones your lambda ends are non-zero otherwise I guess otherwise why are you writing it you know <laughs> you should insist that these lambdas be non-zero right golly now the one thing I haven't explained or even talked about yet is this tau z what's that about that's kind of a new idea. So 
So this Tao Z um, is a translation by Z. Um, so I believe Tao Z F um, is a composition of the translation in F. So what that what that means? Um, golly, is that right? Uh, sorry, I, I I'm. I am now like, oh, that's weird. That's page 41. Man, that's weird. So this is F of X minus Z. <laughs> so that, um, I mean, fine. They write what they write, but that is not what I would write left to my own volition because we're composing f with this translation function, you know? And so, like, left to my own devices, this would mean f of x plus z. But that's not what it means. This is definition. So, I would say this is an example of writing composition on the other side. Because, you know, if I, if I was to say, you know, let's, let's, let's kill, come up with another name, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Pac-Man. Pac-Man of, uh, Pac-Man of X equals to, uh, Pac-Man sub Z of X equals to X minus Z, you know? Then <clears throat> if I take F and I compose it with Pac-Man Z and I act on X, well, then that's, by definition, f of x minus z, you know? So to me, the composition is like that, but they're writing it like this. So in terms of how I write composition everywhere else in mathematics, this is backwards. So, but okay. I'm sure it's standard. Um, so the, the, the larger point here is it's nice to write it this way because then what what happens if you translate like the, the you know if you translate this function what happens you just translate each one of the uh, each one of the steps like the translation translation of f is equal to the translation of the the, the same representation translated I mean it's you just put a, a tau sub z on everything okay so um, cha. So the translation by Z on this, this F right here is lambda one translation by Z on F1 plus lambda two translation by Z on F2 plus dot, 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 plus, you know, lambda N translation by Z on FN. <clears throat> so what does that do? <clears throat> Excuse me. Graphically, what's going on? If you look at y equals, you know, just tell me, I look at y equals f of x versus y equals f of x minus z for some fixed z. What is, what is this? What's the relation? Yeah, it's just, it's a translation to the right by z units, right? <clears throat> and so in view of that, of course this is true, right? The area under a graph and the area under the graph shoved z units to the right, it's the same. Keep in mind the area here is being calculated over, basically these integrals are always over all of everything. Like you're always integrating in some sense over the whole real line. You've just made it zero outside the place you're interested in. I think that's part of the, uh, the idea here. Anyway, let's go on. All right, so <sighs> getting through technical preliminaries with speed is not my gift. Let's forge ahead here. So the um,
lemma 2.2.3, you've got f a step function, all right? And the support of f is a subset of, say, a1, b1, union, a2, b2, union, da, da, union, you know, a, n, b, n, all right? If that's the setup and if the absolute value of f is less than m for some m, constant, all right? Then the integral of the absolute value of f, all right, is less than or equal to m times the sum k equals 1 to n of b sub k minus a sub k, right? <clears throat> So again, that, that inequality here has to be understood for, in, in, you know, that means that the function is less than, uh, I mean, first of all, it's a step function. It's not just any function, right? But um, that step function is less than m for everywhere, you know, which really just concerns the union of these intervals, right? But anyway. Um, so this makes a lot of sense if you just think about it intuitively. Um, if there's no overlap between the intervals, this is just like basically the sum of their lengths, right? So this is the sum of the, sum of the widths of the steps, and this is the maximum step width. So the maximum area is bounded by, you know, maximum step height times the length of all steps added together. But it also compensates for the overlapping issue, right? So it's more than just what I said. It's because you don't have to have non-overlapping steps, right? The steps, they can be like this one. All right. So that's lemma 2.23. And then, ooh, lemma 2.24 is a little bit exciting. That may be, may be too much, but uh, here it is, 2.24. I'm not sure exciting is the right word, but suppose you have, um, a, so you have a partition, A1, um, B1, A2, B2, and so forth and so on. So it doesn't have to be a finite list, all right? Um, be a partition. Um, of the interval A to B, all right? What does that mean? What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, but what, what does it mean for, if you have a collection of sets and they're said to be a partition of another set, what does that mean? This is a general set theory term. Yeah, disjoint union, right. So the union covers, covers all the, the interval A to B, right? And we also have that like AI, BJ intersect with, you know, A, excuse me, AI, BI with AJBJ is what? This is, is empty for I not equal to J, right? So disjoint, like you said, yeah, disjoint union. Um, all right, then, um, so the union covers all. Well, that, in set theory that terms, that means the union I equals one to infinity of AI, BI, 
is equal to AB, okay? And, um, okay, so then what's the, what's the punchline here? Then the sum, n equals one to infinity, let's say k, k equals, I used k, he used n, k equals one to infinity of b sub k minus a sub k is equal to what? What's that? B minus A, right. Now, this is intuitively obvious, right? But he does give a careful proof using completeness of the real numbers and arguments involving the least upper bound. And it's like a half a page. It's somewhat technical. All right. So he says this lemma might, may sound like something obvious something that should not require proof. On the other hand, the proof is unexpectedly difficult. The following example shows the same property formulated for rational numbers is false, although it sounds equally obvious. That indicates that some special properties of the reals are essential here. So the nuts and bolts of proving this involve the completeness of the reals. All right? You have to use the least upper pound property for, for a set you construct. And his next example, um, he's like, he's, I'm not sure I really want to write all this down. I'm just going to just write a little bit of it, just enough to get into trouble. So A, B, sub Q, he defines like half open rational intervals, which is to say the set of all rational numbers that are, um, less than or equal to x and strictly less than b is that. He says, we will show for any epsilon greater than zero Okay, well the interesting part of this example is an exercise. <laughs> Let's see here. I'll just try to write the punchline here. He's like zero, one, the rational numbers from zero to one not inclusive is a subset of the union um, n equals one to infinity of the, um, you know, a n b n taken from the rationals. And, um, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of bn minus an is less than epsilon. Well, let me state it more specific, more carefully. He says, we will show that for any epsilon greater than zero and any epsilon in q. All right. for any epsilon greater than zero in Q, all right, there exist, there exist intervals like this of rationals, collections of rational numbers, let's say, um, such that zero, one is contained in their, their, their union and yet, when you try to do what we just did over here, <laughs> not only does it not add up to one minus zero, you can make it arbitrarily small. The tables have turned here <laughs> quite a bit, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is not to say that you, I, well, I don't know, maybe you could find well, let me, not, let me not speculate on what, how you could modify this example. I haven't thought through the technical details of, but the, the point of this example is that this is a, is a, is a real phenomena. Be, uh, you know, 
it's because we're working with real numbers, there are no gaps in, that completeness is what gets this for us. And the fact that the rationals are not complete is allows us to come up with such devilish examples as this. Um, okay, so moving on. Moving on. So, theorem two point two six. It says let um, F sub n be a non increasing sequence. non-increasing sequence of non-negative step functions such that the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x is equal to zero for all x in the reals, then the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of, of the of the integral of fn rather is equal to zero. I have questions. <laughs> What does it mean? Has he defined these things before? Maybe I just need to use my brain. All right, let's, let's try to think about it. Um, Non-increasing sequence, so... Digits of pi. Uh, like, you know, you can formulate pi as a sequence of like just taking every. Oh, well, that might be increasing towards pi. Uh, non, let's see, non increasing means, what does that mean? Um, it's that time of the day. What, what does non increasing mean for a regular sequence? Can you tell me? Well, I mean, if he said decreasing, I'd be like, okay, yeah. I know what decreasing means. Exactly. It, just, it has me worried. Oh, my book. Does he define, in the, in the index, does he have a definition of non-increasing? And, and if I was, listen, guys, if I, if I had taught real analysis, I think I would know this for sure, but I have some vague memory of learning about this before, and I'm, I'm a little bit shaky on So not increasing sequence of non-negative step functions. Um, I think it I, I think it means I think it means decreasing. I think this comes from the, the family of language where increasing and decreasing means strictly increase and strictly decrease. I, I think that's what's going on here. I think that's what's going on here. Um, so when I, so there's, there's different schools of thought on the language, yeah? So some people say strictly increasing, right, strictly increasing, and then they talk about increasing, and they talk about decreasing, and they talk about strictly decreasing. Sorry if I'm outside your uh, universe, Audric. So, you know, in that way of thinking, um, you know, functions which are constant are both increasing and decreasing, right? And functions that are strictly increasing or strictly decreasing are ones that 
um, preserve strict inequality. But um, other people just replace this becomes increasing. This becomes non-decreasing, um, I think. And I believe this becomes non-increasing. And this just becomes decreasing. I, I could be wrong, but I think that's what's going on here. Um, and my apologies in advance if I'm wrong about this, but I, that, that's, you know, this, this, unfortunately, this language is slightly ambiguous depending on what book you're reading. But my, my guess is that's what we're talking about here. F is non, so F uh, non increasing means that it's, uh, it's either decreasing or it's constant, all right? So non increasing would suggest either basically either, either decreasing or it could be constant for a little bit. Okay, so in view of that terminology, this theorem is like totally unsurprising. So you have a sequence of step functions, right? They're, they're positive, right? So their values are above the uh, x-axis and the limit um, as you go on out, they're, they're limiting to zero for all x, right? So um, Um, so in, in other words, uh, mm. I don't know about a general sequence of, I'm talking about step functions at the moment, so I'm not. Yeah. Well, I'm, I would, so that's um, probably going to be the case, and this is the prototype of that theorem. Okay. Okay. So um, I, would, I would wager, yeah, this is probably true for LeBay integrable functions. But if memory serves me correctly, first you prove these sort of, um, you know, kind of low-tech, intuitively obvious theorems about step functions, and then you kind of bootstrap your way up from that to functions which are more interesting. So, um, so if you think about limit as n goes to infinity of, of, of the function going to zero, that means for, um, for each epsilon greater than zero, you can pick an n sufficiently large that the, you know, the graph of the, those step functions beyond that big n, their, their graphs are pretty, pretty, pretty slim. And so, it, and then you think about, you know, so in other words, the integral, and, and if you think about the integral of such graphs, well, it's also pretty slim, right? And so it seems reasonable that you can make that as, it seems reasonable that you can make this as small as you want for n sufficiently large, if you can make the graphs as small as you want for n sufficiently large. Yeah, so there's that, um, that one. And the proof, of course, is in the book, and it's probably a page, yeah. Yes, it is. In fact, it's a page and a half. That's not an easy one. All right, and then the, the section ends with corollary 2.27, which says the following. If you have f a non-decreasing sequence, so what's this going to be? You want to guess? Non-decreasing, non-decreasing, decreasing sequence of non-positive is it going to be? A non-decreasing sequence of step functions. All right. Then what? If oh, okay, well it wasn't what I thought. If the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in the reals, then z limit as n goes to infinity of z integral 
of fn, well, that sequence is also has a limit which is greater than or equal to zero. Now, the proof of that is just a couple lines. He, he just makes a creative use of the previous corollary and constructs a, a non-increasing sequence which has to converge to zero and then um, then he uses that max, he uses a sneaky argument involving a max of two things and then he, he uses the uh, linearity of the integral and takes a limit. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty sneaky. A lot of uh, um, a lot of his little constructions in the section are coming together in that final three sentences of this, this corollary, so it's this neat. All right, so before the day is lost, <laughs> let us actually define, ooh, I may yet make it under an hour, we'll see. I was trying to get this video under an hour. <laughs> I got nine minutes to define the LeBay integral. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> so, as the next section, which is the third section, section 2.3, he leads with the, uh, the definition here of LeBay integrable functions. So, I gotta go back to the math department. I gotta get some more black markers. My black markers are all kind of getting kind of cruddy. Definition. Ah, this one's good. So we're defining, um, man, I always put the S at the start. There's no S there. It's L-E-B, E-S-G, and you, I sometimes see it spelled with a Q, but anyway. So LeBay integrable functions in a, in a grubble, not integral, integrable function. All right, so a real valued function um, on, 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 on R, all right, is called LeBay integrable Um, if there exists ooh, a sequence, all right, of step functions Fn, all right, such that the following two conditions are satisfied. A, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of the absolute value of the step function is less than infinity. And b, f of x is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of fn of x for every x in R such that the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the absolute value of fn of x is less than infinity. All right. If, the, if, this is, if these terms and conditions are met, then the integral of f is defined by integral of f is equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of fn.
Moreover, if a function f and sequence of step functions fn satisfy a and b, then write f uh, well, it's one equals, it's one, it's like this. I would say approximately, but that's not quite what that is. That symbol there. Or, aka, f, I'm just going to say approximately because maybe, well, maybe he'll tell me in a second, f1 plus f2 plus da da da. Does he have language? Uh. Come on, dude. Give me some words. He's got no words for me. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Well. Well, anyway, the, the, the reason for that notation is the, uh, really the content of the rest of the section. So he's, he's going to spend the next, I don't know, you know, two, three, four pages really developing why we should think of those. That's a symbol we often use for equivalent, right? So as a... Uh, All right, let's just, you know, name calling aside. What do you guys think? So are we saying that's a slash or equivalent? Um, let's say equivalent at the moment okay. till we have a better language. Eventually, we have this um, terminology almost everywhere. And I think the almost everywhere um, uh, terminology will will clarify these things more precisely in terms of the language. But so what's going on here? It's a, a real value function is Lebesgue integrable. If there's a sequence of step functions, what does this condition mean? Oh, yeah. So the area of the step functions is not infinite. And what else? The sum of the sequences is the function, yeah. I might have said that kind of poorly. But that's right, the 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 step functions sum to give the form of a function, right? The sum of the step functions is the function. Yeah. Right? Sum in the sense of series. Rather I should say this, the sum of the series gives the function. That's a better way to say it, because the sum of the series should be the limit of the sequence of the partial sums, right? Yeah. Whereas sometimes people use the term series to indicate the process of summation as opposed to the outcome, which is the sum. Yeah. So yeah, the function is the sum of the step functions. And we define the integral just by doing what? Well, if you want to integrate the function, you just integrate the step functions which represent it, right? Interesting. Nice. Yeah. So, why why is this more general than like the Riemann integral? Can you guys tell me about that? What what are the limitations of the Riemann integral? I mean, we're we're trying to supplant the Riemann integral. We got twenty seconds to explain it, so I'll I'll just I'll get to it. It's, it's this, the Riemann integration really only can be pushed for finitely many piecewise discontinuities, piecewise discontinuities, whereas this is perfectly content to deal with as many discontinuities as you have, as long as the area is bounded. This will deal with very, very discontinuous things and still make sense of adding area under it. You don't have to have finitely many jumps, you could have